so my mother now, when my mother was was attending community college, she was about 19. She was a single mom. She gave birth to me when she was very young. I mean, my mother was so young. I think she and I went to elementary school together. And um, and so here we were. You know, when we first started out, we lived in um, in the projects in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, and then eventually she met my father and married him. And you know, I, I just remember. I remember going through the school system. I remember it was not a very good experience. Um, I remember uh, being told that I was not as smart as the other kids, uh, being placed in special education, being told that I should be put on medication. They told my mother these things about Ritalin and all this stuff that they do to so many black boys across the country. And uh, fortunately, she fought against some of that. But really, academically, I really didn't see much potential there. I mean, I really didn't show any potential. I didn't know that there was potential. So, uh, so I finished high school. Um, couldn't really go to the military because there was a war and, and I don't like the idea of getting shot. I heard that it hurts, so I didn't want to get shot. No, that's a bad thing. And uh, I, I didn't want to just kind of be on the street and I knew that I didn't really want to work and, and not be empowered. I knew I didn't want to get pimped. I didn't want to be told what to do. I hate when people tell me what to do. And so uh, at the same time, I was uh, 17 when my girlfriend got pregnant. And, uh, you know, uh, that was my first girlfriend. That was my first girlfriend. And, and, um, and, and I had sex with her. And then I found out about this thing called pregnancy that happens nine months later. And that kind of disturbed me. And so she, she gave birth to my daughter when I was a freshman in college. And so here I was, you know, 18 year old, sing, uh, 18 year old father uh, with this new baby, not really knowing what to do. Um, and I didn't know what I wanted to major in in college. And so uh, they said, what do you want to major in? I said, I don't know what's finance. They said, well, finance is money. I said, okay, I, well, I, must, I want to study that because I figured that if I study money and learned about money, somebody would pay me money to talk about money. And so I studied money, and I continued to study it on and on and on. And that first semester, I remember, uh, I had never really studied before. You know, I remember sitting down, and I would try to read a book, and I couldn't read, like, two pages without going crazy. You know, uh, you know how it is. You just sit there. You try to concentrate. You just can't. You know, and, and I just um, um, I just sat there and I kept trying and, and, and I eventually came up with a philosophy as far as studying. And I said, OK, well, you know, I, I don't know really how to study, but I knew from playing sports that if you want to beat the next guy, you had to practice harder than the next guy. And you can't practice at the last minute. Like you can't start practicing the day before the championship. You have to practice several months in advance and you have to practice consistently. And so since I love sports, you know, I made it into a game. I, I you know, people say you go into the library, I'd be like, no, nah, man, I'm going to practice. You know, and just kind of being silly. So every day I would just practice, practice, practice. The other thing that I, that I figured out, again, this is 18-year-old logic here. Um, I've learned a few things since then. I remember thinking, you know, okay, uh, well, I, I didn't know how hard I had to study to get good grades, but I said, well, I guess I'll study four hours a day. You know, I figured if I study four hours a day, that'll get me where I want to get to. And so people think, oh, my God, four hours a day, that's, that's a lot, four to five hours a day. And, and, and so my logic, though, was, you know, at that time I was working at Taco Bell, and I said, if I can go work for these fools for eight, nine, ten hours a day for minimum wage, I can sit down and I can study for four hours a day. I mean, you see, and, that, and I think that's important. When I, the more I reflect on that, the more adamant I become, because it makes no sense that, you know, w w a lot of us, you know, when we're young, we'll, squ we'll scream and squirm over the idea of studying three, four, five hours a day and study doing that every day. But we'll go out and work for some company for eight, nine, ten hours a day as slave wages. I mean, that's stupid. That's the slave mentality. I mean, how are you going to work harder for somebody else's dream than you are for your own dream? That's crazy, right? So the logic to me was very simple. And so, uh, and, not, and this is not about me. This is not about my story. This is just to tell you, you know, kind of where it all, where some of these ideas kind of started. And, uh, and, and, and once I realized I could actually do this stuff, um, you know, and I did, I made straight A's that first semester, and it was a shock to me because I'd never done anything like that before. I'd never, I'd, I'd really probably made one A all through high school, and that was like in PE or something because I was a good athlete. I'd never really known that feeling before. So once I knew that feeling, I never let it go. I just continued. It's like uh, when Michael Jordan, you know, couldn't win any championships, he finally won his first one. And then what happened? He kept winning, you know, one after the other after the other. It was kind of the same thing. So uh, years later, uh, one of the things that I've learned, and, and in terms of, you know, thinking about things that I would say to myself if I could go back, you know, to when I was 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 years old, is I would say this. Education is probably the most important thing you'll ever get in your whole entire life. Uh, when you, you, one of the biggest mistakes that black people have made is that we run away from education. Some of us do. When you run away from education, you are running towards slavery. 
And because the fact of the matter is that if you can't think for yourself, if you can't act for yourself, if you can't position yourself to be successful, there is always somebody sitting around waiting to, uh, waiting to control you and to own you. Uh, the best example I can think of is a guy I went to uh, college with, and I'm not going to say his name, but you know, if I said his name, you would know exactly who I'm talking about. Uh, and he was, uh, he was a, a basketball star in, in high school. Uh, he couldn't, he, he came to college, he could not read. And it didn't bother him that he could not read, and it didn't bother the university he couldn't read. They didn't care. They were making $20 million a year off his kids, so they didn't care if he could read or not. In fact, whenever he got caught, brought up on academic misconduct charges for having his tutors write his papers for him, the faculty would block the charge. They would protect him. So he goes to the NBA, and he, he, he doesn't think learning how to read is important. So he goes to the NBA. He made $110 million, and now he's broke, flat broke. And a lot of these former athletes are flat broke. Allen Iverson is flat broke. Stephon Marbury is flat broke. A lot of Fantasia, the singer, is flat broke. What's the common thread here? Well, the reality is that no matter how talented you are at anything, if you don't have an education, you are a sitting duck waiting for somebody to exploit you and to screw you over. And this is an important message so that even if I'm preaching to the choir, even if you understand this already, there's somebody out there you know who does not understand this. And I think that one thing that's very important when it comes to these messages, these messages that our community needs to understand, these messages that are seeking to some extent destroy our community, if, if, when people don't hear them, one of the things we have to understand is that we all have to be soldiers in this battle. You know, you can't just take care of you and yours. You can't just think about what you're going to do. You need to think about what your friends are doing, what your families are doing, what your homeboys are doing, what your girls are doing, whatever. Like, share this with people because to some extent, what you know, the knowledge and the energy and the message that you spread is a virus. It can be a good virus that spreads to other people, but it can be a bad virus that spreads to other people. If a, if a parent abuses their child, think about what kind of terror that child can be to the rest of society and how many people that abused, damaged individual can hurt during the course of their lifetime, all because of what somebody did to them growing up. Well, the same thing is true on the other extreme. When a child is in, in, infected with something good, something positive, something strong, well, they affect hundreds and maybe thousands of people throughout their lives. So you can never underestimate the power that you have to make a difference in the world that's around you. And, and I think that's very important to understand. Now, we talked earlier about money, and I was talking about the importance. Mike and Christina, how are you? They are so embarrassed right now because they really probably never thought that I would, that I would s talk about them right in the middle of a sentence. But I'm happy to see them. That's uh, Pastor Micah Edmondson and his wife, Dr. Christina Edmondson. And they are um, esteemed scholars, and, uh, and, and Pastor Edmondson is, is, is my man. Got a lot of respect for him. And Dr. Christina has been in uh, Essence Magazine and some other places, and she is a, uh, a, a valued intellectual commodity in the black community. Now, and the reason I'm being informal is because we have a small group, and I think it's very important to get, the, get, to get our message together and to talk about what we're going to talk about. So earlier we were talking about money, and I was telling you how that, you know, majoring in finance was important to me because I wanted to make money. I didn't want to be broke. Well, one of the things that's very interesting is that if you look throughout our society, the way we see money is kind of interesting. You know, I wouldn't say bad or good. I would just say it's interesting. We live in a capitalist democracy. We live in a society where making a little bit of money can make you forgive almost any sin. You know, uh, uh, R. Kelly can sing. He's got a lot of money, so people kind of forget that he was having sex with 12-year-old girls. Like, you know, if, if you look across the board, you see uh, situations where individuals have been forgiven for atrocious sins against the community because of how much money they make. So while I can certainly appreciate and respect what capitalism can do for you, and, and all of us, I think all of us who grow up without money can understand the value of having money, I encourage you to understand that money, to some extent, is a tool for you to enhance your life and the lives of those around you, and not necessarily something that defines you. It doesn't make what you're, it doesn't make a, 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 a bad activity become a good activity. It doesn't make a, 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 you know, a, a hateful person into a righteous person. Money is something that uh, is very powerful. It's like fire. Fire can cook your food and keep you warm, or it can burn you alive. Or like a drug. A drug can heal you and make you better, or it can turn you into an addict. So when you go into the world and you make your money, you want to understand that the mo you have to control the money. If you let the money control you, then you are, again, signing yourself up for slavery. And I know multimillionaires who allow money to control them. So when you talk about money, and you talk about the way we see money in our society, um, you have to think about black history a little bit. And you think about, for example, Dr. King's dream. Okay? Now, Dr. King's dream, I think, is, is, is interesting because, first of all, 
uh, I remember hearing a story from, um, from Jesse Jackson's daughter, Santita. She's a great lady. And I remember she told me, she said, she said, you know, Boyce, one of the things that, that really freaks me out about Dr. King and his speech on the March on Washington, you know, the I Have a Dream speech that everybody talks about, uh, she said, you know, on that day, there were a lot of people that didn't even want him to speak. They didn't even want him up there because at that time, he was unpopular. Eighty percent of white Americans did not like him. And 55 percent of black Americans disapproved of him. So even black people didn't like him that much because the stuff he was saying was truthful, but it was not popular. And so she said, and it's amazing that now that's the only speech that people remember. And so it's interesting, though, when you look at our society and you compare it to Dr. King's dream and you think about the fact that we celebrate this man's life every single year, we, you know, when his birthday comes up and all that good stuff, I don't know if Dr. King really dream, dreamt of a society where income inequality would be what it is right now, where the richest 5% of Americans accumulate half of the wealth. I don't think that he dreamed of a society where black family wealth would be 1 50th that of white families. I don't, I don't think Dr. King dreamed of that. I don't think that Dr. King dreamed of a society where workers' wages would remain flat from 1999 to the year 2012, where the real wage of the Amer American worker has not gone up. I don't think Dr. King dreamed of a society where we're going around declaring war on other countries just to get their oil. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of space, there's a huge gap between where we are and where we think we are as a society. 